morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for the warm intro, and I guess I might have to delay my flight. I didn't know there was a raffle today, so we'll see. Um, so as, as I said, my name is Charles Lambert. I'm a distinguished engineer at Discover. Uh, happy to be here with you guys um, and talk a little bit about the different roles that I've had in the past and the journeys that have taken me to Kubernetes, uh, some patterns that I've used and found useful in doing so. Uh, you know, currently as a DE, I take some of those experiences and learnings and help teams develop, develop uh, systems that will meet the test of time, which is uh, one of the hard ones. Uh, I usually try to think about some of the illities uh, in software development, maintainability, reliability, availability, as we develop some of these systems and try to take that test of time. Uh, you know, this includes identifying challenges, technical interdependencies across the organization, and then suggesting solutions to address them. Uh, so what's in it for you? Uh, hopefully, um, understand useful patterns in Kubernetes. Uh, if you're getting started, um, maybe you find those useful. If you're thinking about adopting Kubernetes, maybe uh, learn a little bit about why I've adopted Kubernetes in the past. It's not a you know, one size fits all. Uh, so hopefully, get some ideas as to why I've done that in the past. And so I wanted to bring up a little bit about my career timeline and tell you, I guess, how I got into Kubernetes. Uh, I started my journey in tech with cars, which is, uh, I'm not sure how standard that is, but uh, in high school, I started working on carbureted cars, all mechanical, uh, easy to understand for me in high school. Uh, but then I started to have issues debugging fuel injected cars. <laughs> so, you know. Uh, how the computers worked, uh, most of the mechanics there they didn't really know, uh, and got me interested in hardware, which led me to IBM eventually, um, where we developed, uh, I, I basically worked at the hardware and operating system level uh, with some of their power systems and uh, uh, solutions, uh, hardware solutions. Uh, eventually, uh, wanting to you know, break down those systems and deepen my education, I went to a master's in system design management uh, and complex systems, um, and with that foundation of hardware and OS uh, and product development, I started being curious and moving up the stack uh, just out of curiosity, um, you know, up, up to cloud, up to DevOps, up to app dev and web apps, um, and I think that foundation of having a clear understanding of hardware of the way to object-oriented programming helped me in the Kubernetes world to understand it. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about how I got into Kubernetes. And, you know, you might ask uh, why is Discover here? And really, we just want to tell our story, uh, what we're doing, some of the stuff that we're working on. And I also wanted to pinpoint, you know, uh, a little bit about why I joined Discover. And I think, uh, you know, you see here people, process, and technology. Uh, and important for me, is that our culture focuses on people, uh, you know, both process and technology, but really Discover focuses on our people, enabling each other to develop our craft. Uh, so folks are um, encouraged to upskill and develop each other, which is, I think, something uh, really important in the tech industry. Um, so I'll, I'll double click on this later at the end with our Discover approach. But I wanted to bring this up now uh, as part of my career path, which is one of the reasons why I joined Discover. So uh, why Kubernetes? Uh, this is a personal perspective. Uh, I, I think most of you have seen, potentially, I'm not sure where everybody's in their Kubernetes journey. Uh, maybe if I can get a raise of hands of who's actively using Kubernetes. OK. Uh, Okay, that's uh, less than 50%, so okay. So maybe not every one of you have seen this depict, uh, this image, but on the left hand, we have like the pre-Kubernetes standard. You have your large war file that gets deployed on the VM or whatever instance. Uh, you have your, your data layer, uh, your web server that serves all the requests, and then you know, your browser that goes and access them. Usually you have multiple teams all interacting to get the server stood up. Uh, to the deployments, to the development, they're all interacting with that single component, um, which is okay in some cases, right? Um, 
mainly if you're starting up your startup, you want to do a POC MVP up and running, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, on the right side, you have all this, the Kubernetes uh, sort of depiction where you have services that are maintained by teams, you know, broken up. Each one has, you know, the build your own the main mentality. Um, and with that depiction on the right, I personally have seen a lot of uh, correlation between what people say Kubernetes and people say microservices. Like, and it's okay. I think the um, for those who don't know Kubernetes, you know, it's a continuous orchestration platform. Uh, the smallest um, object within Kubernetes is a pod, which it can be a single container mapped to a pod or multiple containers mapped to a pod, but Kubernetes is the most basic object that understands as a pod. Um, and so with that in mind, it's easy to relate a pod to a service and you know make that extension to microservices, but not a lot of people have that luxury of starting there. So I'll deep dive into the microservices piece on the next, on the next piece. Um, but here I wanted to focus on reasons why I personally have adopted Kubernetes in the past. Uh, some of these include cost, velocity, portability, availability, scalability, and so on. You see some of these on the left. A lot of them are abilities that you see in software. Um, so um, going back to my first take, when I started Kubernetes, this was back in um, 2017. Uh, and so in 2017, cloud providers such as uh, Azure Adelis were starting with their offerings of Azure, of um, Kubernetes, AKS was, I think, generally available in August 2017, I believe. Uh, don't quote me on the date, but sometime in 2017. And so we moved over Kubernetes for portability. We had a requirement that we had to deploy on all clouds or on-prem, uh, our solution. And we also had an issue where we started out with VMs and as our, as our applications grew, we had so many VMs running that our budget went uh, a little bit crazy. So that was mainly from a requirements perspective for portability, but also we want to take care of our budget. Um, and this stack was mainly Spring Boot for our backend services and front end was Angular at the time. Uh, we kept our data layer at uh, either native offerings. We didn't use stateful sets at the time. Um, so it was either on the VM on-prem, the data layer, or on a native offering from one of the cloud providers. Um, and we managed our configs through config maps. Uh, so it, it, it worked great. Uh, one of the things that Kubernetes allowed us was to re use resources more efficiently. Um, so for those who are not familiar with the Kubernetes architecture, you have your master nodes and then you have your worker nodes and pods get allocated based on resource allocation, priority, there's affinity, anti-affinity rules that get defined as well, depending on how you want your pods to run. But at its most basic form, you know, Kubernetes is a cattle of CPU and memory and resources, and your pod asks for it, and Kubernetes makes a decision of where it's best to run. Uh, and so that allows you to more efficient, efficiently use your resources of your, you know, CPU, memory at its most basic form. Uh, compute layer, um, and so we were able to break down our costs and also make sure that we, as we developed our containers, developed our config maps, developed our YAML files, our manifest, we were able to deploy uh, in multiple places, uh, anytime, anywhere. Uh, back in 2017, we ran into the issue where people were still adopting, or the, the curve of Kubernetes was still going very sharply, and not everybody had Kubernetes, uh, so uh, even though cloud providers were there, maybe some of our customers didn't have it enabled for use internally, so uh, we ended up shipping container images at the end of the day, uh, which was not great, not ideal, but you know we met our requirements. So first take, cost, portability. Uh, second take, I changed roles, uh, and I'm working with a team that had that first depiction that you see on the left, which is uh, and that, way, that time, the stack was uh, mainly Django, uh, which had our backend, front end, uh, our data layer was Postgres, uh, and we had an issue with deployment. It took us about three to four hours to deploy to all our servers. It was 50 plus VMs, um, and we had issues with scalability to meet customer demand, 
Uh, we were scaling vertically, not horizontally, uh, which was an issue. So uh, here, availability, scalability were some of the main issues that we ran into and Kubernetes was able to help us. Uh, what we did was basically uh, break down, and I'll talk to this when we talk about microservices, but uh, we just broke down our front end goes into a pod, our back end goes into another pod, data layer stays in the native offering, a cloud offering, uh, and now that allows us at its most basic form or back end to scale as needed or front end to scale as needed. Um, and the nice thing about you know, the deployment was we updated the image spec and then you know, voila, things get updated. We adopted Spinnaker with Helm for, for this scenario. So we went from four hours to update all our VMs to less than 10 minutes, uh, which was great. You know, the ability to deploy test rollback um, was very, very easy, easily done. Um, so that, that, was, that, was, that was great. Uh, the addition of being able to scale horizontally was great. Now we were able to meet our customer requirements. We were able to reduce the cost you know, of having unused resources to having Kubernetes manage resource utilization and scaling um, was the second take. And so I want to talk the final third take, which is different, uh, because when I joined this team, they were already using Kubernetes, but they weren't using it efficiently. Uh, and I wanted to talk about this because it was an interesting uh, case. Um, this team was using Kubernetes, predefined no, like, uh, no, no auto-scaling, just predefined number of nodes, containers get deployed on it as a stack, but they were using I think over 100 plus clusters with up to 14 nodes each uh, to test your feature, to QA the feature, to do staging. So we ended up with over 100 plus clusters, which was at that time, you know, there was no abstraction layer for managing all the clusters, but you know, uh, it was all static number of nodes, which meant budget was crazy. Uh, so it was hard to maintain from an operations perspective. Uh, and it was hard to maintain from a budget perspective. So here we had a different take, and I think some of the patterns that I'll talk in the next slide will, were useful here. We built uh, multi-tenant clusters, so we didn't want to hinder the productivity and velocity of the teams. What we built was mapped clusters to namespaces and teams and built a multi-tenant cluster where teams would get uh, namespaces for them to use and go crazy as much as they wanted. Uh, but we were able to implement limit ranges to ensure that they define resources as needed. We were able to implement things like RBAC to ensure that they talked only to who they needed to talk to uh, and do ingress based on an L7 layer with an ingress controller. So some of those best practices that you see in Kubernetes we were able to enforce at the multi-tenant layer uh, without hindering developer productivity. Um, and so we use that opportunity to implement some of those standardized tooling, including observability. We you know, deployed Prometheus Grafana, log shipping, and then teams would just go and be able to see all their pods, which they weren't doing at that time. Uh, so uh, that, was a, that was a good uh, learning. Um, uh, that the, that multi-tenant cluster then evolved into what we call our container orchestration platform, which was built on Kubernetes, but with things from the open source world like Kata for you know, event-driven auto-scaling, uh, deployment of operators for you know, our data and event messaging, uh, we were able to standardize how people on the rack were three sources outside of Kubernetes. And I'll talk about that in the patterns, but the operator pattern allowed us to extend outside of the cluster into items that you know, humans were doing or maybe an Ansible pipeline we're doing, we, deploy the, we were doing now in a declarative way within Kubernetes to interact with you know, a Redis cache or with your data layer or with a blob store uh, in a standard way with YAML. So um, now we've built a platform around that that allows you to extend outside of just your container orchestration platform. Uh, that, was, that, was, that was pretty cool. Um, so, uh, okay. Patterns uh, that I called out that I think were useful. There's a lot more, but I wanted to call these out specifically. Uh, sidecar pattern. Um, 
you know, like I say, usually you don't have the luxury of a clean slate. Well, I'll start with the microservices crash stuff there. Usually you don't have a luxury of a clean slate. Uh, sometimes you do, and it's easier to start breaking those out. Uh, then I've seen microservices, like I said, be thrown out with the Kubernetes because it's, the more and more you, I see is the patterns, you know, facade adapter patterns that you see within object-oriented programming start applying into the Kubernetes world where you, know, you can see an object being maybe a pod uh, that gets extended through, you know, there's actually adapter patterns, sidecar patterns, operator patterns uh, within Kubernetes um, that, you know, some of that uh, object-oriented programming uh, patterns that we use in software development to start getting applied to Kubernetes. And so that encapsulation of functionality in the service or a pod starts getting applied and now it's easy to translate that to a microservice. But in my experience, it's really not that easy. So, um, and it's not really a best approach. If you're starting out with, you know, like when we had that Django application, it was a one big thing being thrown in the VM. It's not that easy to break that into services day one. Like it's a big bang approach. It's not really easy. Uh, it implements a lot of risks. So, you know, we want to move towards microservices if it makes sense for you. But no, that shift involves people, process, and technology, uh, which is not that easy. So, I found on the left, you know, sidecar pattern. You are able to enhance your pods, uh, and they will reuse and encapsulate functionality uh, with a sidecar. And for those who have not used Kubernetes, the idea is that you have a pod with a container, which might be your app. You know, think about your Spring Boot app uh, that maybe, you know, it's doing X functionality. Maybe it's writing logs to var log in a text format. Uh, and maybe what, it, what you do is you have a sidecar or another container within that pod, a secondary container that, you know, takes those logs, transforms them to JSON and ships them somewhere. That's your, you know, basic functionality. Or maybe you want to route all your authentication or the certificate management to that sidecar and abstract that from your uh, Spring Boot container. So it allows you to enhance and reuse that container across other pods that maybe other teams, you know, maybe the other team is using Django and they're also writing to a var log and text and then maybe that allows you to standardize your log shipping via sidecar. You know, you just plug it into your YAML, deploy it and it ships. Um, uh, the one thing to, to caveat there is that I have seen an abuse of that pattern where you have like your app and like three or four other containers being used in conjunction with it where, so you know, just be, be careful because then your limits, resources start getting, you know, your, your pod starts getting fatter and fatter in terms of the CPU memory that it needs, storage, and it gets a little bit more picky. So, you know, be careful not to overuse it. Uh, use it where it makes sense. Um, because there's other things such as, I didn't mention here, but you know, an adapter pattern where maybe uh, within your application, build an adapter so that it ships logs maybe now in the JSON format through you know, a Gradle, Maven, whatever you want dependency. So you know, take that into account. Um, uh, secondly, I want to talk about the operator pattern that I, that I mentioned in my last one, on my last slide. The operator pattern aims to capture uh, human behavior um, within the cluster itself. So, uh, you know, the idea is that the, manner, the, peop, the human who is managing a service or a set of services uh, is captured within uh, the operator. It's not really for migration, but it's helpful to keep in mind as, the, as you mature with your adoption process. Um, you know, the way you see is like, you know, when I talked about the multi-tenant cluster, we had n number of namespaces. They wanted to keep it a standard set of tooling, and then we wanted to standardize the way people talk to external services, you know. So think about the human operator being, you know, deploying a database or instantiating a blob store. Uh, there are things that you want to standardize, maybe uh, managing the life cycle of your objects, you know, how long till it archives, how long till it cleans up, how often you do a snapshot of your database, those are things that maybe you keep in, in Terraform and Ansible or even a human, you know, a human ops person doing. So the operator pattern allows you to capture that and ensure that really it's a loop, right? What it does is that within Kubernetes, you're able to extend functionality outside and um, 
keep that loop to go and check, you know, do I need to go and do a, a snapshot of the database because the time has been met. Um, and so maybe before deleting a database, you go delete the object within Kubernetes and before you make the API call, take a snapshot and archive it. Things like that that maybe a human would do, you're able to capture it within an operator uh, and extend the functionality outside the cluster. Um, the last one, I'm not sure I would call it a pattern, but I'll just call it service discovery. Uh, I think I have seen it called out as a pattern, but in my experience adopting Kubernetes, one of the shifts that exist is into the networking piece of it of the cluster. So depending on how your cluster is set up, you'll have a, a container native interface, network interface, CNI, uh, or you'll have you know, uh, an abstraction of a networking layer uh, within Kubernetes. And so that just means basically do you have a, an IP within your VNet or, or, or not? Um, and so people want to, what I've seen with when adopting it is that you want to, you know, what is the IP of my pod or what is, you know, can, how can I discover, you know, the, the other pod within another namespace? How can I talk to it? And uh, Kubernetes does a good job with its own DNS definition, either core DNS, cube DNS, depending on what you're using. There's, you know, different open source projects out there, but leverage, leverage service discovery with Kubernetes. It's, it's pretty easy. It's pretty cool. It allows you to talk to services both internal and external with you know, either service name, a cluster IP, uh, external name that allows you to define uh, you know, even external DNS so you're able to route to external services. Uh, so don't underestimate the power of service discovery within Kubernetes and use ingress controllers. They're pretty powerful for an L7 layer routing perspective. Um, so things like very specifically routing to slash or slash app slash home route to X service and you know apply filters to your to your headers or apply specific rules. Um, so leverage this, leverage those those ingress controllers. They're very powerful. Uh, leverage service study with the Kubernetes. Uh, don't out of the box just try to you know reinvent DNS. A lot of people have seen that. Uh, you know, I built this really cool thing. Well, really, you could have done that maybe with just DNS. Um, so, something to keep in mind. And so, they want helpful items, um, which may differ from your non Kubernetes deployment. I think to keep in mind service discovery, like I said, leverage Kubernetes native service discovery as much as you can. Uh, think about if you're going to be using storage within the cluster, persistent volume claims, stateful sets. Um, define your storage classes based on your needs. A lot of the clusters, when you create them, have predefined storage classes, which may or may not fit your needs, but think about that. Um, route and expose your services via ingress controllers. Uh, very powerful. Usually you need either, you know, one ingress controller, you know, that's usually the case. You might want to have one external and one internal, so maybe two ingress controllers. Think about your class names there. Um, Leverage config, config max for your app configuration. And I've seen it very easily, you know, you know, just brute force, you want to start from scratch, brute force mounting your application properties as a config file, like just mount it as either environment variables or as an environment, or mount it as a file. Uh, config maps can be very useful. Uh, stay, start day one, so if you're, you know, migrating a Spring Boot app, you have application properties that you were leveraging, uh, maybe in your JVM as a, as, a, as a file being added, you know, just mount it. Um, declare your ideal states via manifests. Uh, a lot of times for the folks who have not used Kubernetes, don't be afraid to just start with static manifests and just updating that file. As you get to learn, you'll be able to move to other things like Helm or other templating tools that might be a little bit more flexible, but uh, I've seen teams want to start with Helm or templating tools day one and never deploy to Kubernetes and there's a learning curve. So, you know, take it one step at a time. There's no, there's no issue with, with manifest. Um, and the last one that I think gets missed a lot is observability. I mentioned the networking layer being a little bit more complex within Kubernetes and so debugging can be hard. Make sure you have the information you need when you're, when you'll need it. So, uh, you know, a lot of the standard stacks from the open source world, uh, Prometheus, Grafana, so if you're gonna use FluentD to ship logs, make sure that you are logging, make sure that you're able to trace 
if you're using tracing, uh, you know, Jaeger, whatever other open source project, make sure you are able to trace your calls. You know, do you have an issue with namespace and namespace communication? Do you have an issue at the DNS layer for your VNet? Do you have a DNS issue at the cluster level? Uh, and so having that information available when you need it is going to be very important because things are going to go great day one and maybe day 10, you know, you have a, an issue with the customer that's customer facing and you don't have the info you need, it's going to get hard. You're going to start, once you start using kubectl and executing into containers, that's when, you, that's when you know things are not going great and your observability stuck. Um, and so all, the, all of this to say that, you know, maybe start with a standard way of how you deploy and take, a, take that approach. So I wanted to bring up one of the things that we started doing at, at Discover, which are golden paths. Uh, and it's basically a step-to-step -step tutorial that walks you through basically our opinionated way and supported path of doing something. In this case, you know, creating a Spring Boot app component, deploying it to OpenShift, right? And that might start with creating a repo, cloning a repo, um, you know, creating, getting a namespace, and not everything needs to be automated. Ideal, yes, there's an ideal way to automate end-to-end -end that golden path, but just having that documentation end-to-end -end of an ideal state explicitly defining the best steps to accomplish a task can be very helpful. It's, you know, it's a very helpful task for a developer day one. It makes information for common tasks easy to find. It provides information to engineers that they need to bring to complete that task um, in a standard way. And so things like, you know, we talk about observability, we talk about how you route, we talk about how you deploy. Those things can be covered in a standard way so that, you know, Day three comes and you say, oh, I forgot to you know, ship my logs to var log, whatever standard location that you're shipping your logs from, right? Um, and so even though it might be some manual steps or it might be fully automated, the, the, this approach should encompass both code, but all three, code, community, and, cult and, and, uh, and culture, right? Uh, or the process or the way we do things. So um, this takes me to my next piece or section, which was you know, discover approach. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, we talked about code commuting culture at the, at the Golden Paths piece. Um, and here, if you see, you know, to achieve our goal of becoming a digital leading bank, um, we must, you know, be a, we want to focus on being a product center organization and having a single agile way of working. And so that single agile way of working is an important piece. Um, because it, it links to the way we do things, it links to our culture, and so, you know, it encompasses the agile work, encompasses people, process technology, and so imagine, you know, I, I, I gave you guys a little bit of a glimpse with the goal of the past, but imagine an org where we have documentation about how we do pair programming, how we do code reviews, how we do contract testing, and so you go to a single state, you'll be able to see that information, at Discover, we define uh, what we call Craftworks, which is an inner open source model that helps define our methodology. So it's built by engineers, for engineers. Um, any dev is able to go publish. It's all tracked in Git. It's all you know documented in Git. So you're able to do a pull request, get feedback from people. Uh, you're able to publish either a golden path uh, you want to define you know, process for your team, how you're doing code reviews. Uh, and it's really an inner open source model uh, that comes alive with the Discover community uh, as defined within Craftworks. Um, and so when you start to standardize your approach to some of these things, and now I'm extending outside of Kubernetes as you see, but once you start standardizing some of these, approach, these approaches, not just deploying to Kubernetes, but you know, how you do code reviews, how you should know where or how to get, you know, a backlog uh, for your new team, uh, how to write your user stories, how to engage with, you know, a staging environment. It helps you get those things up and going fast to reach higher velocity or escape velocity where now we can focus on what I mentioned at the beginning in the culture, growing your craft, right? So investing in upskilling, learning new things that you want to focus on. Um, and so, that's, that's an important piece for us where we're able to upscale and develop our individuals um, in a way that we're able to achieve our goals 
as an organization, but also our, our team members are able to grow as individuals. So Craftworks is, uh, Craftworks is an important element to us uh, in achieving those goals. Uh, I'm not sure how we're on time, but um, you know, that's basically what I had for today. I'm gonna to open up for Q&A. Um, if you guys have any questions specifically around Kubernetes or some of the patterns, experiences, I'd love to hear from you guys. Uh, I'll also be down at our Discover booth if you guys wanna talk. I'll hope to see you guys later there today. And so we'll open up for Q&A. Yeah? It, uh, within the Kubernetes, my personal experience, so I, in my personal experience, I have used, uh, oh, uh, I, I guess your question was, in my journey to Kubernetes, have I used uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry or just VMware, OpenShift, or what, what, have, what are the specific instantiations of Kubernetes that I've used in my experience? Uh, at Discover. Oh, at Discover? At Discover, we leverage OpenShift, as you see, uh, in our golden path. So we're currently um, migrating all of our services. There's a big push from our leadership uh, and the developers to move over to everything to OpenShift, um, which is one of the things that I like about Discover. You know, we talk about process, talk about cold, uh, code, culture, and community, and you know, all the way from leadership to developers, there's, uh, there's of course a lot of opportunities, but there's uh, always a push to get better over time and you know, to be able to become that leading digital bank. So uh, at Discover, we currently use OpenShift to answer your question. Uh, I guess I, I didn't repeat the question, but uh, the question was at Discover, what do we use? We're currently using OpenShift. Um, but I'm gonna extend your question to in my journey to Kubernetes, what have I used? Uh, we, I, I've used AKS, I've used Kubernetes on-prem, I've used Rancher, PCF, uh, GKE, so uh, I've stood up specific uh, clusters as well from, from scratch. Yeah? So, uh, so the question is, how do we sell moving from PCF to OpenShift? Was there any pushback or challenges in that scenario? Um, I can't answer the specific Discover question because I, I wasn't at Discover when that decision was made or that shift, right? I joined uh, Discover not too long ago. We're already on the ship over to OpenShift, so that was already there. But um, I have another experiences, personal experiences in other roles shifted from other platforms such as PCF over to specific Kubernetes. Um, and I guess the answer is, uh, you're not gonna like the answer, but it depends. You know, Kubernetes is not for everyone. Kubernetes, there's a learning curve. Uh, you know, while it does give you a little bit more control over your resources, managing, you, you need a lot, your developers need to learn a lot. They need to learn Templating, they learn about service discovery, they need to learn about routing, they need to learn about you know, stateful sets. It's not as easy as you know, build, push, deploy. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with that. It's just you have to take into account what's good for your team, your organization. Um, Kubernetes has a, a steep learning curve, right? There's, there's stuff and that's you know, not hitting, and I think it's one of the issues that most teams run into. While Kubernetes is great because it gives you control, it gives you extensibility, portability, and availability. You know, a lot of abilities that you want in your in your teams, there's a learning curve to it. And debugging is hard. Like I've run into issues where like your DN, your cube or core DNS within your cluster, some DNS pods were responding and some not. And so sometimes you're able to route to the pod and sometimes not. And like, okay, like, you know. Two pods were bad, and you know there was a bug within the open source project, and so it's not. I don't think it's for everyone, but it's certainly becoming very widely adopted, and you know almost uh, 
a, a commodity, an operating system of the future, right, Kubernetes is. So uh, I think it'll mature and get easier over time, which, as it has. You know, back in 2017, uh, there was certainly a lot of bug fixing and cleaning up, and people were deploying Drelgy with QCTL. Now we have a lot of tooling. We have GitLab. You have uh, Spinnaker. You have, you know, built-in plugins for Jenkins to run your workers on Kubernetes. There's you know, the community grows and grows over time and it becomes more and more stable. So uh, there's actually, I believe there's an open source project called uh, KF that tries to mimic behavior of, of PCF on Kubernetes, right? So KF build, KF push, and at the end of the day, what you're driving is getting your source code into a container via standard entry and exposing it. So technically you could do that if you want to, right, as well. But again, you're going to have to manage that cluster. Yeah, question? I have a question about the development culture and how Kubernetes has affected that. In your journey to migrate away from like the EE services running inside like the application container into like separate Kubernetes services, has that afforded your dev teams the ability to like split off into smaller groups and make more collaborative? So, oh, is, there, is there a mic? So can you repeat the question? Sorry, that was a long one. I'll repeat that uh, for everyone. My question was about the uh, development culture and whether or not Kubernetes has given you the payoff of being able to decouple your development cycle and work in smaller teams on smaller segments of functionality? Um, good question. So, I, you know, I've had that experience a couple of times with different roles. Um, I guess the first thing that I'll mention is sometimes there's nothing wrong with, you know, having a monolith. People always like to say, you know, monoliths are bad, it's, it's the worst, but you know, if you have a small app, a small team, and you're deploying your backend front-end services, like it's it's fine. Like if that's what you what's that's what fits your needs. As you scale and grow, you know maybe your monolith gets too big and it's hard to manage. And there's you know git commit conflicts. You're doing a lot of cherry picking to you know avoid conflicts, and maybe your releases get harder and harder. Then maybe you can think about some of those payoffs. So. Um, I guess I'll break down the question. Um, migrating from a large model into going into services, sometimes, you know, first I'll say I found it easier to encapsulate as much as I can. For example, if we're going to go from a VM to the container world, can we split, you know, maybe you have, maybe, you're, maybe it's easier to split that model into just two jar files and, and split those two. Uh, you don't, it's for me in my experience it's been hard to go from big bang approach you know you go from a to n and then there's a lot of risk in that and things that you might have missed or testing that you might have not covered um, and so because you know everything changes when you go to those services every team is deploying their own at their own speed team is team b is saying hey i can't test against team a because it's not stable uh, you know, how do I, where do I get the staging environment and you know, other things that come into mind when you talk about microservices or other challenges come into play. But going into that journey, what I've found useful is uh, talk about patterns that you can use. So like an adapter pattern where you start breaking off or chipping off. Uh, first encapsulate into as that monolith into a container or a, you know, two or three containers, if that makes sense but don't go with that service, microservices approach day one. And then once you break up that container, you know, you go from one VM to maybe two containers or one container, whatever it is, start thinking about your 12 factor app principles, uh, start breaking that up and start making those vertical slices as it makes sense into services, they're business oriented. Um, take that approach first. And as you break up and you go into the services architecture, you are going to run into other challenges that are different. Maybe each team is able to deploy, deliver functionality much easier. Maybe you go from delivering releases every month to every sprint or every two months to every sprint, whatever that is. Um, they'll have their cadences, but then you're going to run into other issues of, you know, not everything's perfect. You know, 
dependencies between the services, tagging, deploying, having a single release between the microservices, uh, breaking changes between teams. You know, team A depends on API v1, then they're going to v2. How do they have to have that work back in? Um, so I think there is payoff. You do get higher velocity. You do get, you know, build it. You own the teams that have that mentality of, you know, not throwing a brick over the wall and there's responsibility and accountability for what they own. Um, because at the end of the day, they own their service, they're building that services. Um, but there's other challenges that come into play with that, right? So to your question, the payoffs that you mentioned, I, yes, they're there, but there are other things that come into play then. Okay. All right, uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, the next session is starting in three minutes. Uh, so we're unfortunately gonna have to, uh, Charles will take questions uh, in the sponsor area uh, by the Discover booth if you have any more follow-up questions. So uh, again, sessions are starting, next set of sessions are starting in three minutes. So uh, please head on over to the other rooms. And of course, there's a session here. A big round of applause for Charles, everyone. Thanks everyone. <laughs>